My presentation today, my remarks are entitled uh, something about something for everyone. Well, I'll, I'll just pause right there because when the government looked at how to respond to this question, this threat and opportunity that comes from cyberspace, we came to the conclusion that it didn't belong to any one of a number of departments. It didn't belong to the police or diplomats or, you know, you can name them all, Department of Business. Actually, everyone had a part to play in it, and that's what makes this so difficult. It's, it's actually, it covers all aspects of our lives. As, it's, as it shows up there, I'm an engineer. I actually took a degree in uh, electronics in the 1970s, and so at that time, computer degree courses didn't, didn't really exist that much. Um, I guess had I been going through it again, I would be a computer scientist. Right, so actually I want to start by showing a video. Now, some of the things that I picked out of that, essentially we can no longer protect ourselves in this environment. The guy who said, you know, if somebody puts their mind to it, there's not a lot you can do about it. This is really quite a profound problem. This is a man-made environment, after all, and I'm going to go on to say that this is an environment we're all utterly dependent upon. And yet, well, I'll offer you a challenge in this room. How many of us feel that we know enough to be confident about our safety, security, online. It's a very difficult issue, but you have to ask yourselves, given this is a man-made environment, how do we find ourselves to be here and what do we want to do about it? So that's essentially what I want to discuss today. Detection and prosecution, unlikely, said the person there on that video. Actually, a... did anybody work out which country it zoomed out of at the end? Did you spot the... London? It was, it was London, and yet that's an American video. So I think somebody in the trustworthy computing area of Microsoft's got, either got a sense of humour or their heart's in London. But I think it's quite right, because after all, the UK is the centre of the known universe, or perhaps, <laughs> perhaps not. Okay, so um, what I want to do next is I want to ask, well, what is cyberspace? Because I think one of the problems we have in this uh, topic is that it's mysterious, and I want to try to demystify it. So I start off with, well, we'll start off with the physical layer. Um, if you think about this in just uh, in terms of the history of mankind, it's, it's not been that long since distance was um, an absolute barrier to communication. You could argue it was maybe in the uh, late, um, the late 1800s, maybe the early 1900s. Marconi, after all, uh, made the first transatlantic radio communication, what was it, 1901. We've come an awfully long way in that time. And what we now have is an environment which I will show, uh, this is IP, this is an IP network, which essentially connects all of the um, computers that are scattered across our globe together in a way that makes location and distance almost irrelevant. That to me is one of the first parameters of, um, of this space that uh, we now live in. So when I talk about this layer, I'm, I'm talking about you know 10.0.0.1 um, uh, or whatever, an IP address locates something in that space. But actually, most of us don't think in those terms. Most users actually think in terms of a network layer. This is my this is my uh, homage to Matrix. Um, the previous actually the previous one. While we're just talking about pictures, the previous picture here um, appears in the first national strategy for cyber security for the UK back in. 2008, and it appears there because I was asked 6:30 one evening by my then boss in the cabinet office. He said, Don't, uh, "Mike, uh, need a need a picture of the internet." So that's the picture of the internet. Now, actually, these days I don't think I would use that, but I, I thought it was such an excellent picture out of uh, Wikipedia. Most people, I think, um, would think of the internet and cyberspace as being something that is referenced by www dot something or other, or maybe Microsoft uh, Office 365, a service, software as a service, or whatever, but essentially in that layer there. I guess the next layer I would construct is the device layer, and then finally, of course, you've got the persona layer. Um, at this point, uh, when I'm having this conversation, I very often ask people, how many devices do they actually have? Now, in a corporate environment, I can tell you the answer, the average, is three point something or two point something, depending on the people you ask. 
And most corporate audiences, if I ever ask this question, you know, you just put, just put your hands up, job. Um, most people are carrying a personal one of these, a corporate one of these, and a corporate one of those, all in a briefcase, all at the same time. That's the environment we're in at the moment. That's important. I'll come back to that in a moment. So, you know, we deal with these various devices. So I said uh, I, would, I would define where do I think cyberspace is. I think it's this layer of abstraction here. For most users, they see it as being accessed through here. I think some engineers may well think of it from looking up from the bottom wherever their servers are. But this is, this is the man-made layer that we've created. This is the environment that we're talking about. And this is the thing that we're here to, to make secure. But before I talk um, about security, I want to just finish off in this section by um, looking at the big changes that are shaping this environment and trying relating them to uh, my, my graphic here. Let's see. Um, well, let's start with the Internet of Things. There's actually a rather good article uh, in the magazine, ENT magazine, which is the IET's monthly magazine, called The Internet of Everything. And in here, uh, there are some interesting little facts about devices that will be connected to the internet and what it will uh, mean to us all in the future. One of the most interesting ones from my perspective for the Internet of Things is the Google Car, which is now uh, licensed to be used in a number of states in the United States where it drives itself around. It's quite a scary thought, I have to say. And there's a man who works in Google called Vint Cerf, and I heard him speak a while ago, and uh, he asked a rhetorical question about the, um, the Google car, which I thought most in, most instructive. How does the car know that the tree, that tree on the side of the road, how does the Google car know that, that tree isn't about to leap out in front of it? Does it use radar, lidar, you know, lasers? No, no, no. Yeah, but we don't do that sort of stuff. Yeah, no. The answer he said is because. It was there five minutes ago, and it was there ten minutes ago, and it was there yesterday. And the implication, of course, is that the car is connected to a humongous network, and the network knows everything about everywhere the car is going to be driving in the future and has been in the past. <coughs> and so every vehicle going down every road is constructing and helping refine a view of the environment. <coughs> and to me, that was the most brilliant example of a number of really interesting features to this space. I mean, we can go into privacy in a minute, but uh, just the fact that we're talking about phenomenal amounts of data here. Another area which I'll pick out is that of uh, the, human, the human body and health, the idea of being telemetered. If you've got a bit of a dodgy heart or something like that, it may be onset of diabetes, then actually being telemetered, creating data about the state of your body and being able to record and analyze that is very, very powerful indeed in terms, of, um, in, in terms of our future health. I can just see this opening up in a number of places, but as we create this massive data, so Internet of Things, it enriches this layer. How many people, when they saw this rhetorical question, thought, yeah, that's fine, <clears throat> those are the devices, aren't they? After all, those are the devices we access cyberspace with, they are our, our laptops and our phones, our smartphones. Increasingly, we're going to end up with devices we don't interact with directly, like smart meters. This, this layer is going to comprise many machines with a lot of machine-to-machine -machine communication that is going to reflect our environment. And what's more, the internet, under the Internet of Things uh, paradigm, these things are going to actually affect our environment. <coughs> <coughs> I'll talk later about buildings, smart buildings, but just imagine if your building is telemetered and controlled, then you're going to have computers controlling your very physical environment. And that's a step away from what we do today, essentially where we use these devices just to gain access to information and to communicate with other people. So vast amounts of data will be produced. Where does it go? Well, generally, frankly, I think people would say the cloud, of course. Well, where is the cloud? I think what the cloud is doing is moving data off this layer. <clears throat> well, I'll say, it's into, <clears throat> I'll say it's into that layer. Of course, it ends up physically somewhere. It ends up physically in a country. But as far as I'm concerned, it ends up in here. 
because I don't know where it is. And if I actually store my data in the cloud, one of the problems I've got now is that I don't know in whose jurisdiction it resides. Now, if I'm a company, that can be really important because if I ship, if your university, this university ships your personal data into the cloud and it goes outside the European economic area, someone somewhere is in trouble. But if you use Dropbox or you use Google Docs, do you know where the documents are? I mean, this, these are the sort of problems that we now face by this having this layer of abstraction here. Not that it isn't good. I use Google Docs too. This is, this is the, of course, the problem, isn't it? The, the benefits are hugely attractive. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I think I'll touch on bring your own device next. Um, Increasingly, companies, and particularly in the United States, I think, are seeing the attractions of, of allowing people, or even sometimes insisting, that people bring their own devices to work. They pay for their own. Hey, it's great saving, isn't it? I welcome that to some degree as an individual, because I find it really irritating having two calendars, mm. and having however many inboxes, and living my life split into different places, because uh, I have a corporate device and a private device. But there are some considerable difficulties merging those two worlds. Because if I put corporate data, my, my, my daughter's a doctor, and I find her with her iPhone sometimes with patient data. Uh, not that I find, you know, I have, I've come across the fact that she's been doing something and she's been referring to a patient. And I said to her, you can't have patient data on your private device, can you? The conversation goes downhill at this point and involves <laughs> words like, shut up, Dad. But, yeah, and, it, and I'm, I'm sure it's all perfectly within the policy rules. But you can see my point that, you, you know, if she loses her iPhone, then what? If they want to, if, if you accept that you're going to put corporate data onto your own personal device, does that mean they can remotely zap it if you lose it? All sorts of difficult questions there. Um, next one, I think, mobility. Um, Essentially, the environment that we are creating here with this layer of abstraction is that I can be anywhere and still gain access to my information, to my services. So, ge geographically, I can, I can move about. And what's more, with mobile access, it means uh, I can be in the remotest places, on the tops of mountains or whatever, and still gain access to, to my data. And this is fabulous. So, we've now got an environment that I think has two forms of ubiquity. Everything I want to know, I can find by typing in, I ask Google, frankly. I'm sure other good browsers, other good search engines exist, but you know, <laughs> I, use, I use that to find out if I have a recipe, Google. And I expect to be able to do that on the top of Mount Snowden. So ubiquity and universal access is brilliant, but the problem with this is the other side. The, pe the piece that I was talking about with the Google car, it means that the system now knows an awful lot about us. Because it, it is beginning to personalise the relationship we have with it. And I think that, I, I, I describe this environment as a man-made environment. It's really a quite unique point in history we're going through now, where we have created an environment where that sort of data exhaust that we're generating uh, through our, our uh, mouse click actions creates a reflection of us in a way that we really haven't come to terms with. So, I said I would tell you what cyberspace was. I did earlier. If I tell you what cybersecurity is, I think it's what I just said. How do you make sure that your world, your, your experience in that environment, this phenomenal environment we've created, is, is what, well, is what? I think, let's come out with some words. Um, move on to... So, as far as the user is concerned, what is cybersecurity for the user? I'm going to go through those three words now, because I think this is this is what cybersecurity is. If you're um, a bit of a sort of pedant and you think, well, those words they sort of overlap. Yeah, I know they do, but I can't think of anything better. Um, safety and security is another good one. It turns out they're the same word in German and French and doubtless other languages too, but they mean slightly different things to us. So, I accept that these aren't perfectly disjoint, uh, non-overlapping. <coughs> I want to be safe, and I'm going to use privacy as my definition of, of uh, as uh, the closest thing to, to safe at this point. 
I think that we've got a we've got a, we've got a problem here. Um, the public has lost trust or is losing trust in this space and our ability to sustain privacy in this environment. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. Uh, who's seen Minority Report? The yeah, okay, one hand, right. Very good. Oh, excellent. In fact, I think I could do a, I, I think I could do a presentation on along the lines of cybersecurity as predicted by Hollywood, because an awful lot of my illustrations are are from uh, future-looking films. So, for those who haven't, Minority Report is predominantly about looking into the future, but there's a scary sort of dystopian future world described in another way, where a man. The hero, John Alder Alderton, something like that, walks through a mall, shopping mall, and lasers scan everybody's retinas and they work out who the people are. <coughs> Perfectly safe, I, I guess. Uh, anyway, uh, so as you walk through the shopping mall, you get voices beam to you saying, uh, Tell me what a new jacket. We've got jackets on sale. John, John, you normally drink a pub, you, know, you normally have a beer about this time of day. Do you fancy a beer? Now, that's an example to me of either an invasion of privacy or the brilliant benefit of focused, targeted advertising. It depends on how you look at it. The other story I want to describe here is of um, uh, uh, an American hardware, well, general purpose store, which I won't name, but I'm sure you can find out which one it is if you look. The story goes that um, there was a family and the daughter started getting coupons for baby wear, you know, nappies, diapers, whatever. Father got rather angry with the shop, phoned up, said, what do you, do? Do you, what do you think you're doing? My daughter is a teenager. Shop was very, very embarrassed and uh, said, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, pay, we'll stop to that. Father then phoned up a couple of weeks later with an apology back to the shop saying, actually, I owe you an apology. There are some things that have been happening that I wasn't aware of. It turns out my daughter is pregnant, uh, but she is only a teenager. Uh, well, anyway, what was happening was the powerful analytics engines were spotting the changing patterns of her purchases. She was operating using her family's loyalty card, so her family were being sent coupons for baby wear because she'd stopped buying scented soap or something, I don't know. Is a, now, is that an invasion of privacy or what? Um, you think about the Google <laughs> Analytics that uh, provide down the down the right hand side of the screen are those those adverts that are spookily focused on the sort of things you were just searching for. So we want, I think, we want safety in a national security sense, but we don't want surveillance, do we? And we want to have targeted a targeted personalised experience when we are looking on the internet. Because I don't want answers in Swedish and French and Chinese, thanks, because I don't read them. I want them in English and I want them pertinent to my focus, local focus. But on the other hand, I don't want the system knowing all about me. So it's not binary, and the question is, how do we establish trust? And that's the word I wanted to leave us with on this first one. I think that we have got to re-establish trust. And that's government, it's the private sector, it's all of the providers. And I think what we as users have got to do is to better understand the issues surrounding um, how we behave, what we want from that environment. I'll move on to security next. Uh, do you remember the video? Um, it's rather hard now to make ourselves secure. By secure, I'm really talking about confidentiality, integrity, availability, the sort of things that we all learn when we are taught about basic uh, security principles. And at this point, I could talk about phishing attacks and IP theft and identity theft, which are all examples of, of that kind of um, security issue. I'm not going to rehearse all of that. You can find that information elsewhere. What I really want to focus on is, well, why are we in this position? Why are our systems so, so indefensible? In fact, somewhere, I think I've got a quote from the... Yes, this is from the National Academy of Engineering, 2012, so maybe a bit over a year old. Um, personal privacy and national security in the 21st century both depend on protecting a set of systems that didn't even exist until the late 20th century. The electronic web of information sharing known as cyberspace. It goes on later to say, yet research and development for security systems has not progressed much beyond a strategy akin to plugging the hole in the dike 
cobbling together software patches when vulnerabilities are discovered. I think the problem is that we are trying to defend a system that wasn't built to be the way that we are now using it. And when we talk about security, one of the problems we face is not knowing what good enough looks like in terms of our behaviour or our mitigating actions, or frankly for building the new systems. Let's just stick to the user though for a moment. I asked you earlier, my challenge was, how confident are you that you know what good enough is to protect yourself? That calibration and those metrics, those, those um, indicators are actually lacking in this space. If you cross the road in front of a truck, you have a pretty good idea of what risks you're taking. I think we lack those intrinsic, those natural indicators in this space to tell us whether we're taking an awful risk or frankly not very much at all. And that leads us to <clears throat> the whole question of standards. I mean, there's quite a lot of work being done on this at the moment. It's an area that I work in a great deal uh, now. Uh, now that I've uh, set up uh, independently. The government's actually just issued a, a request for um, evidence on standards and uh, uh, there was a, an announcement by a minister a couple of days ago in Lancaster, Lancaster House. Happy to talk more about that in Q&A if you're interested. Um, I cho I, I've chosen not to go down that sort of rabbit hole particularly, but uh, happy to tell you more about where the government is on that. So, in terms of security, um, one final thing to say. You might say with standards, um, well, as long as I'm compliant with the best practice standard, then I'm okay, aren't I? No. I'm going to offer you a quote. Uh, it's a quote from a respected colleague of mine. Being compliant doesn't make you secure. Being secure doesn't make you compliant. They're two different things. You can be compliant, but the trouble is the rules tend, the standards tend to be fighting our, the last battle. They tend to be looking backwards. You've really got to do risk management as well. Again, a huge topic, worthy of a lecture in itself. So I'll move on though to resilience. Now, under resilience, I really want to talk about the critical infrastructure, the concept that um, if, if, if the power system is reliant upon the networks, Cyberspace, and cyberspace goes down, and the power stops. Right? Well, this matters now. So we are we're now concerned about the resilience, not only of cyberspace, but everything that depends upon it. And I think there is ample evidence that we are in a fairly dangerous place here. So much so that, and I'll just refer to governments again. I'll refer to President Obama. Actually, he told the uh, appropriate organisation, the U.S. government. NIST. For those who are into standards, NIST 853, NIST SP 800 series will be very familiar to you. Well, the people that produce that have been told to produce a framework for the critical infrastructure in the US and get on with it and get on with it now. And they wanted to see an interim version by October, which was published. He wants to see the final thing by next February by presidential directive, which is pretty unusual. Now, the details aren't the point. The point is that it takes him to do it. And um, there are similar concerns, I think, in other countries about the manner in which we've ended up in a, in a dangerous place with the, uh, with the critical in well, in a, in a place that needs some attention with the critical, with the critical uh, infrastructure. This is nearly my last picture, I think. Next one. Oh, it's back to the matrix. Um, and now, for engineers, because I guess most of us in this room <coughs> are engineers or have an allegiance to engineering. Those are the three things that I'm going to pick out and I'm going to address in my last couple of minutes. System complexity. This is a systems engineering observation, I suppose. There are two areas that concern me about the systems that we are now producing. One is their unbounded nature, the fact that there are interdependencies beyond the system that you can control, you can look at. And the other um, is about malicious activity within the system. Um, I'll give you just one uh, um, illustration, I think, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the <coughs> beyond the beyond the bounds of the system. I was listening to a guy talking yesterday, he said, um, trains now have a brilliant safety system. The doors won't open until the train's in the station. Good. Yeah, I like that. <coughs> How does it determine the train's in the station? Answer, it uses GPS. 
If the GPS system is interfered with and the train comes into the station, you can't get out. Well, you probably can by breaking something or pushing a button or whatever, but you know, here's, you know, there are thoughts like that. So the train systems are now dependent upon GPS in a manner that may not be immediately obvious. And certainly, this was an individual from the environment of trains and communications, and he was concerned about the manner in which we are building these uh, ever more complex systems. I chaired, um, it was actually an IET conference uh, on safety and cybersecurity down in Cardiff about a month ago, just over a month ago. And my conclusion, my wrapping up words there were that I was challenging the safety and, and cybersecurity community. Did we actually have the systems engineering and safety engineering tools to fully deal with the complexity of the environments we are, we are now producing? We as engineers, and there's a room of 150 engineers there, senior engineers. Nobody argued. Uh, there's lots of people looking at their fingernails. I think we do have, we as a community, do have uh, some questions there. Software quality. Where do I start? Um, well, I think uh, there's a lovely Dilbert car too. Dilbert? Does Dilbert make sense to everybody? Does it? Okay. If you haven't seen Dilbert, D I L B E R T, extremely educational well worth looking up on the, uh, on the internet because every feature of engineering that I've ever seen appears in a Dilbert cartoon eventually. Dilbert <coughs> is your hero and he's standing there and he says to the boss, who, who characteristically doesn't understand anything about engineering, uh, this is in the IT community, um, he says to the boss, okay uh, boss we've got a problem, a real problem with our system, with our user interface, we can either spend a million dollars fixing it or we can hope the user doesn't notice or doesn't mind. And the boss says, uh, I think I just heard him say, he saved me a million dollars. The market rewards people getting there first, not getting there right. And this is quite difficult to deal with, because if you get there right but second, you'll go out of business. So it's a, it's a deeper question. We can't just uh, blame the engineering community. Sufficient skills. Uh, I'm personally of the view that as a country we haven't respected and reflected the importance of engineering skills. Now to an audience like this I don't think I need to say very much more than that, but the whole STEM question, the question about whether we have enough, we are generating enough high calibre uh, people for the workforce in wider cyber <coughs> space, cyber security for this environment. I, I don't think we have been in the past. We are now addressing that, you'll know much more about that. In fact, your head of school knows far more about it than I do, so I'm not going to say another word. To finish, this environment has come from nowhere, certainly in my lifetime, frankly, arguably in your lifetime. How long ago was it Steve Jobs stood up with the very first iPhone? Any ideas? Want to shout out? 2007. Yeah, 2006, seven. It was, it was, yeah, it's, it's not that long ago. Before that, we didn't have this ubiquitous access in our pocket. This is just a blink, uh, in, in sort of, in terms of our, in terms of our development of mankind, as it were. This, I, I mean, I think of this now as our global nervous system. That's what this environment is, um, and. There, there is something for everyone in here. I've talked about users, user behaviour, I've talked about um, engineers, but it also concerns policy makers, those who will set standards, it concerns politicians, it concerns diplomats between countries agreeing. Remember the problem about which country am I in? There's something in there for everyone. Um, frankly, that's right, because this is an environment that affects everyone. That's it. Thank you.